I've stopped buying doormats for my home. It all began around five years ago when I lived in a New York City apartment complex, right in the heart of the city. At that time, I was living on my own, far away from my family in Rhode Island, and since I was new to the area, I didn't have many friends. I moved into my apartment, bringing with me only a backpack and two large suitcases, my belongings from home were on their way, but they had to be small enough to fit in the mail and light enough to avoid hefty shipping fees. My family had already been very supportive, but I was fresh out of college, pursuing a career as an editor, and it was a challenging and uncertain lifestyle. My apartment was compact, but it suited my needs. The rooms were tidy and everything worked. Despite the stress, I was content and even excited about my new The neighborhood I lived in was quite rough, and I had to develop a thick skin to handle the occasional insults or harassment from strangers. Crossing the street was once an anxiety-inducing task, but it became routine. The bus station was conveniently located down the street, serving as my primary mode of transportation since I didn't bring my car with me about two years into my job at a publishing house, I had to make a difficult decision. I had recently added some shelves, wall decorations, and a welcome mat to my apartment. The mat had a rainbow design with well written in white letters, a subtle expression of queer pride that gave my home a warm and inviting atmosphere. One evening, everything unfolded as usual. I went to work, returned home, and didn't have any plans to go out. While I enjoyed the city's nightlife occasionally and had a few visitors, nobody had really stuck around. I was protective of where I lived, having had to fend off a few unwanted solicitors. I always kept my door securely locked, especially since I lived on the ground floor. Like that night, I was feeling rather irritated. The neighbor upstairs was playing loud music, and the couple next door seemed to be quite amorous, making a lot of noise. It was just after 8 p.m., and I was watching something on TV. A rare occurrence as I usually relied on my phone for news and listened to office gossip at work. However, I did have a habit of watching the nightly news, a tradition I picked up from my parents. Staying informed about literary news was important to me, though I cared less about local happenings. Suddenly, I heard a faint knocking sound. I perked up but didn't mute the TV. It could have been anything. The knocking persisted, now more assertive and confident. Anxiety began to wash over me. Who would be knocking on my door at this hour? The police? A neighbor? Quietly, I walked over to the door and cautiously peered through the people. Her hand that they chained, the person on the other side was looking down at the floor, wearing a red jacket with the hood obscuring their face. They seemed small, almost like a child, and appeared quite nervous as they waited for me to respond. I cleared my throat and adopted a more authoritative tone, considering someone was knocking on my door. Hello, who's there? The person turned to face the door, revealing a young girl with tears streaming down her face. Without a second thought, I opened the door, more concerned for her than anything else. She couldn't have been more than nine years old. Hi there, little one. Um, are you looking for someone? Is someone with you? I asked gently. I can't find my mom, she sniffled, wiping her eyes. She was dressed in a simple red raincoat that was drenched from the rain outside. I glanced down both ends of the hallway but saw no one else. I knelt down to her eye level. Even though I'm not very tall, I still towered over her. When did you last see her? She was here, but then she was gone. She replied, her words coming out as a tearful jumble. It's okay, we'll find her. Do you know a phone number we can call? She nodded and wiped her face again. Come inside and we'll get you dried off, I said, extending my hand, which she took after a moment. She wiped her shoes on my doormat, and when she looked around my apartment, her eyes widened. Not that I felt embarrassed, but my place wasn't exactly child-friendly. I had a cart of various alcohol bottles and a collection of decorations that weren't suited for young children. I led her into the living room where the TV was. 
She removed her raincoat after I asked if I could hang it on the doorknob outside the apartment. I doubted anyone in the building would take a child's raincoat if they saw it. I hurried to my bathroom to fetch a towel while she stood in the center of the living room, staring at the TV. I offered her the towel and grabbed my phone. Here you go. I'm Derek. Can I get your name? I asked. I'm Cho. I'm calling my mom, she replied in a soft voice. I handed her my phone, which she quickly snatched up. Dialing the numbers, she turned her back to me as the phone rang. I moved to the kitchen to give her some privacy. A small marble island separated the two rooms, allowing me to keep an eye on her as I poured a glass of water. After a few moments, she started speaking in a different language, one I recognized as some form of Asian. She turned to me as I handed her the water and asked, what is this place? These are the shallow reed apartments. I'm in unit five on the first floor, I explained. She spoke again to the person on the phone, looking around the room as if someone might be listening. Our eyes briefly met, and she quickly looked away. I felt a bit awkward standing there. Even though I knew this little girl posed no threat, I couldn't help but feel a bit on edge. A few moments later, Cho handed me back my phone and simply said, she'll be here soon, her gaze fixed on the floor. I looked at my phone, contemplating whether I should call the police or not. Yes, her mother was on the way, but why had she gone missing in the first place? Why did you knock on my door and not the first unit down the hall? I inquired. Sorry, I mean the first door in the hallway. Your carpet, Cho replied. My carpet? I thought, puzzled by her response. What did she mean by that? There's a rainbow. No one else has a rainbow, she explained, as if it were obvious. I realized then that she was referring to my doormat. Shallow Reed Apartments weren't particularly known for being LGBTQ friendly, but I hadn't anticipated that a rainbow doormat would attract a child to my door. Moving on, I asked another question, trying to maintain a calm and comforting tone. How did you and your mom get separated? She didn't answer. Instead, she continued to stare at the ground, her eyes briefly shifting to the TV when the news theme started playing. Could you change this, please? She asked. Out of nowhere, Cho's question about changing the TV channel took me by surprise. But then again, the news isn't exactly a children's favorite. I located the remote where I'd left it on the arm of the couch and switched to a children's show featuring a blue healer family, thinking it would be a more suitable choice than the nightly news. Cho didn't seem very talkative anyway, and I was hoping she would leave soon. About five minutes later, there was an urgent knock at the door. I immediately stood up from my spot on the opposite end of the couch from Cho and rushed to the door. I opened it to find a woman holding Cho's red raincoat. Unlike Cho, she had long black hair and a slight hunch in her back. She looked younger than I'd expected, possibly in her thirties or forties. Cho cried out from behind me, Mama? I quickly stepped aside, allowing the woman to enter my home. I kept the door open, assuming they would be leaving shortly. The mother began speaking to Cho in the same language I had heard over the phone. She cupped her daughter's face in her hands and gave her a thorough once over. She arrived about 10 minutes ago and hasn't said much. I informed them, but the mother didn't acknowledge my pr Could we use your restroom? She has a cut on her arm that needs cleaning, the mother asked. Of course, it's down the hall and to the left. You'll find the first aid kit in the closet, I directed, pointing in the right direction. My bedroom was just across from the bathroom. As they made their way to the bathroom, I couldn't help but notice the mother's curious glances around my apartment. By now, they had seen every corner of it. I hadn't noticed any scratches on the child, but I hadn't really examined her either. While they were in the bathroom, I searched for the TV remote but couldn't find it in its usual spot. Fortunately, in today's digital age, I could control the TV through my phone, 
I changed the channel back to the news and was immediately greeted with footage of a raging house fire that had occurred earlier in the day. Apparently, I hadn't missed the nightly news after all. I could hear Cho and her mother speaking in hushed tones in the bathroom, which was not surprising. I assumed the mother was giving her daughter a stern talking to, though I believed it was more likely due to improper adult supervision than anything Chu had done, but I decided not to interfere. In our last update of the night, we have a local alert brought to you by the police department. We are on the lookout for a group of individuals wanted for home invasion and murder. The news anchor reported it's on the screen. They displayed images of men who all appeared rather nondescript, wearing black masks and having slender figures. They had been breaking into homes, stealing electronics, jewelry, and anything easily sold. But what came next sent a chill down my spine. In their most recent attack, the homeowners had a camera system installed that captured the entire event. I watched in shock as someone in a bright red raincoat appeared on the screen. The recording had audio, and subtitles ran along with it. I can't find my mom. My face drained of color as I lowered the TV volume and glanced behind me to ensure no one was lurking. The bathroom light was still on, but the whispering had ceased. I turned back to the screen, and they fast-forwarded the clip, revealing the same woman who was now in my bathroom. I quickly dialed 911 Sen and turned off the TV. My eyes fixed on the bathroom door. As I was about to reach for the doorknob, a heavy knock resonated through the door. I froze in place, my finger hovering over the call button. From the bathroom, the woman called out that should be my brother. He's our ride home. Could you let him know we'll be right out? Of course, let me just turn off the oven. I stammered. Panic coursed through me as I slowly locked the door and used some mail as an improvised doorstop. I shoved it under the door just as the person knocked again. I jumped back and tiptoed to my bedroom. They pounded the door even harder. I locked my bedroom door behind me and called 911 one 9 of 11. What's your emergency? My house is being broken into by the people from I was cut off by a sudden crash. They had broken down my front door. They're inside my home, I whispered, stepping away from my bedroom door. Sir, what is your location? The intruders were shouting as they smashed my belongings, and I knew my bedroom door wouldn't hold for long. I had to act fast. Without hesitation, I rushed to the one window in my room. I heard the woman crying out her voice pleading, saying they would kill her if I didn't help, that they would kill her child. I opened the window and pushed the screen out of its frame. My bedroom door shook as someone began to pound on it. As I climbed out of my window, a hand firmly grabbed the collar of my shirt. Someone was waiting outside. I dropped my phone as I was pushed to the ground, and I could hear the 911 operator shouting through the phone as it fell and broke against the small rocks outside my building. There were hands around my throat before I could react. The person on top of me used all their weight to pin me down, straddling me. I struggled against their grip, not even having time to panic. All I could do was react. I'll never forget the look in their eyes, the complete disregard for human life. I could see it. Even now, the twisted smile stretched across their lips. I saw myself reflected in the darkness of their eyes. I tried to push their arms away to scratch at their face. My head was pounding and my vision grew darker and darker. I couldn't hear them, but I could see them leaning closer to my face. Their laughter spattered spit across my cheeks. I reached for the ground beneath me and used the last of my strength to aim for those dark eyes. Blood splashed onto my cheek before their laughter turned into agonized screams. As the air rushed back into my lungs, the assailant clutched their eye or what remained of it. I could only squirm away as they removed the small rock lodged there. They pulled out more than just the rock. I finally managed to pick myself up and left the assailant behind, running as fast as I could without looking back. 
I ran across the street and screamed for help at the top of my lungs. There were a few businesses nearby, including a lit-up pizza joint. I ran to their door, yanked it open, and quickly locked the glass door, ready to defend myself if necessary. The employees initially yelled at me, likely preparing to defend themselves, but they stopped and stared when they saw the dark red handprints on my From that point on, everything became a blur of movement. The pizza place employees called the police and I was able to provide them with more information when they arrived. They gathered evidence and swabbed the blood that had splattered on me. My apartment was in shambles as the intruders had smashed anything they couldn't take. The police took me to the station to file a formal report. I told them about Cho and the woman who had come to my door. Hours later, they gave me an update. They had found a man who matched the description I had provided, missing an eye dumped in a garbage bin just 20 minutes from my apartment. Even after spending a week in a hotel and another week at a co-worker's place, there was no sign of the attackers. The police were not very helpful either as they had no leads to follow. I asked them why they had targeted me and they responded by asking if I owned any firearms, which they should have already known. I told them I didn't. The police explained that the other homes that had been targeted had something in common. The first family had close ties to a local church. The second was a group of college students, and the last, the one with the security camera footage of the woman, was a family still in the process of obtaining their U.S. citizenship. It didn't take much to realize that none of us would own firearms or turn away a young child. We were all chosen as easy targets. The police couldn't determine how much the group knew about us until they apprehended them, but they knew enough about me. I've since relocated, taken self-defense courses, and even purchased a handgun that I practice with once a year at the shooting range. I still jump at every knock on the door. But as I write this today, I've come home to find a red raincoat hanging on my doorknob.